I'm David Knowles, and this is Ukraine, the latest. Today, we bring you news from across the battlefront, discuss the latest political and diplomatic updates from around the world, and we speak to historian Sergei Radchenko about the intense diplomacy between Ukraine and Russia in the early months of the full-scale invasion. Bravery takes you through the most unimaginable hardships to finally reward you with victory. If we give President Zelensky the tools, the Ukrainians will finish the job. Slava Ukraini! Nobody's gonna break us. We're strong. We're Ukrainians. Every weekday afternoon, we sit down with leading journalists from the Telegraph's London newsroom and our teams reporting on the ground to bring you the latest news and analysis on the war in Ukraine. It's Friday, the 19th of April, two years and 55 days since the full-scale invasion began. And today I'm joined by our associate editor, Dominic Nichols, and assistant comment editor, Francis Sternley. I started by asking Dom for the latest news from Ukraine. Well, hi, David. Hi, everybody. So the Ukrainian Air Force says it shot down a Russian Tu-22M3, Tupolev Tu-22, long-range bomber. It comes from the fleet, which has been used repeatedly to attack Ukrainian cities. Now, speaking this morning, Air Force Commander Mykolya Arushuk said the bomber, known by the NATO codename Backfire, had crashed in Russia's uh, Stavropol Krai region, that is north of Georgia, about 300 kilometres east of the Kirsch Bridge, to give you an idea where we're talking. According to um, the regional governor there, Vladimir Vladimirov, two pilots ejected from the aircraft, one pilot was uh, allegedly killed, another crew member missing. Now, all, there's confusion around that. There's a crew of four in these things, a pilot, co-pilot, navigator, weapon systems officer. So we don't know who and how many got out and then this report that, that one pilot was killed. So we don't know. But there's um, very dramatic footage, you'll find it on social media, of this thing in a flat spin on fire and coming down. The Russian Defence Ministry claimed the aircraft crashed due to a technical malfunction while returning to its base after completing a combat mission. More of that in a moment. But the Ukrainian Air Force said they shot it down. Now, when I first saw the range that it was said to, what well, I think it's pretty accurate where it came down, at that range, it, it is a significant development suggesting a, either a new technical capability or a modified weapon or some other tactic or, or procedure that's brought this down. So I was a bit confused by it. I was initially sceptical. Always healthy to have a little scepticism. It's probably still there, to be honest. But a statement uh, released later this morning by Mikhail Olyshuk does contain a reference to uh, Ukrainian intelligence. He said... For the first time, the anti-aircraft missile units of the Air Force, in cooperation with Ukraine's main director of intelligence, destroyed a Tu-22M3 long-range strategic bomber, the carrier of Kh-22 cruise missiles, which the Russian terrorists used to attack peaceful Ukrainian cities. And then in a statement put out by Ukraine's military intelligence, they said the, uh, the aircraft was shot down with what they say was the same means that were previously used to shoot the Russian A-50 long-range radar detection and control aircraft. Ukrainian military intelligence spokesperson Andrei Yusov, speaking to Radio Free Europe slash Radio Liberty, said a second Russian aircraft had been forced to turn around after the first one was attacked. And then, just for reference, August last year, General Padanov, the head of Ukraine's military intelligence, said Russia had 27 operable Tu-22 strategic bombers. Now, during another night of air attacks on Ukraine, as well as that Tupolev bomber, Ukraine says it brought down four cruise missiles, 14 Shahid drones and 11 KH-59 or 69 guided air missiles. The Tupolev can carry a maximum of three KH-22 cruise missiles and two of that variant were shot down last night. So they probably came from the aircraft that was subsequently hit. Multiple regions across Ukraine were hit through the wave of attacks last night, including the far western oblasts of Lviv, that borders Poland, obviously, then Rivni to the northeast, running up to the Belarus border, and then um, the, the oblast of Ivano-Frankivsk, that southeast of Lviv, with a very short border with Romania. Russia launched a total of 36 missiles and drones overnight, targeting Ukraine's Dnipro and Odessa oblasts. Eight people, including children, were killed. The last I saw that was about half an hour ago. And at least 29 others injured. That information comes from the General Prosecutor Office. Oblast Governor Sergei Lysak said the strikes caused a fire at a five-storey building in Dnipro, partially destroying it. And then Mayor of Dnipro, Boris Filatov, reported the attacks had hit the very centre of the city. 
And there's imagery you'll see of the railway station in Dnipro that had been hit. It briefly suspended operations. It's now operating again. The bus station was also hit. The drones were reportedly launched from the direction of Primorsko Aktarsk. That's in Russia's Krasnodar Krai area. That's the eastern edge of the Sea of Azov. Also, uh, drones launched from Kursk Oblast to the north of Ukraine, while the missiles were launched from the Ryazan and Kursk Oblast in Russia and the Azov and Black Seas, and also from occupied Crimea. Train stations and bus terminals. You were once a superpower, you know, lads. Look at you now. Now then, next one, David. We reported on Wednesday what was then breaking news about a strike at the Zankoy Air Base in the north of Crimea. We've just seen images that we, we couldn't stand up, so I mentioned it, but, but didn't go into any great detail. More details have now emerged. Ukrainian forces say they attacked an array of military equipment, including four missile launchers, three radar stations, and some other bits and bobs. Ukraine's military intelligence said the number of enemy aviation objects destroyed or damaged and the number of casualties among personnel of the Russian occupation army is being clarified. They claimed it was a successful operation. President Zelensky thanked his top military commander for what he called a correct strike against the occupier and expressed gratitude to service personnel staging special operations, especially important operations, extremely significant ones that destroy the equipment of the Russian army and their combat infrastructure. Now, sticking with General Bedanov at the Military Intelligence Agency, he said that he expects the Russian offensive effort that Ukrainian officials have been forecasting for some time now. He thinks this is going to start in June. In an article for the Washington Post on Wednesday, General Bedanov said Russia will launch a big offensive in, in June this year, narrowing down his recent comments, references to summer. At one point he said May or June. So I don't know what the intelligence is he's working from, but that's his analysis. He says the aim will be to seize all of Luhansk and Donetsk oblasts. But Darnoff also said that Russian forces will continue to attempt to make battlefield games through the rest of this year, up and down the line, just generally, as part of efforts to influence Western decision-making, no doubt, with, a, with one eye on the US presidential election. OK, a couple more. NATO members are discussing, as we mentioned briefly yesterday, but more details. NATO members discussing sending some of their air defence systems to Ukraine. This comes from NATO Sec Gen Jens Stoltenberg speaking at a press conference after the G7 foreign ministers meeting. The poor old loves. They had to go to the island of Capri just off the Gulf of Naples yesterday. Mr Stoltenberg belonged to Emperor Tiberius. Tiberius, one of the most violent and most successful Roman emperors of all time. Indeed. And Tiberius, the middle name, obviously, James T. Kirk. James Tiberius Kirk. I've got him. I've got him. He didn't know it. Oh, happy day. I'm a Star Wars fan, Dom, but anyway. Right. Anyway, Mr. Stoltenberg said NATO is currently working on providing air defence systems, including Patriots, NASAMs, that's the National Advanced Surface Wear Missile System, a short to medium range system, and the AMRAM, the Advanced Medium Range Air-to-Air Missile, um, the AIM-120, American beyond visual range, air-to-air, missile capable of all weather and day-night operations. Mr. Stoltenberg said the Patriot batteries are critical because they are the most advanced. He added that NATO is currently discussing with some specific countries the potential supply of this equipment. And then in a comment that I found quite astounding, given the parallel Ramstein process that's been going on for quite some time now, Mr. Stoltenberg also said NATO needs, quote, a more institutionalised and stable framework for assistance to Ukraine to make it more organised and coordinated. I was surprised by this. He said, in the long run, of course, we cannot continue to be in a situation where Russia is outgunning Ukraine in the way they do now. The Russians are shooting and shooting, and Ukrainians have limited resources to shoot back. And then, in in case the slower members of the club still didn't get it, he said, so Ukrainians need more. As I said yesterday, all good words pointing in the right direction. Now let's see the action. And then just finally for me, David, Russia has claimed that last night it shot down five Ukrainian balloons capable of carrying explosives. Russian authorities have in recent weeks reported balloons appearing over the battlefield. They're thought to be equipped with GPS to aid navigation and targeting, said to be able to carry larger payloads than conventional smaller drones, and they're also harder to detect. These five balloons were downed over the Voronezh and Belgorod regions of Russia, which border Ukraine to the northeast. And there's no word on whether the balloons were red or what happened to the other 94.
a little something there for those of us who came of age in the greatest decade of music, David. Something you wouldn't have a clue about. Dom, where is this, where does all this hostility come from? It's just an ordinary Friday over here. Thank you very much, Dom. Francis Stanley, what have you been looking at? <laughs> Thanks, David. I think Dom's just puffed up after he won that poll of who wore it better earlier in the week. All eyes away from Dom and uh, back onto Washington this week as the West waits expectantly for the outcome of the vote on the military aid package in Congress. Not just relevant for Ukraine, of course, but for Israel, Taiwan and other allies too. The remarks of Speaker Mike Johnson we played in the episode yesterday, stressing the urgency of aid for Ukraine in particular, were nothing short of extraordinary given how long he's held up the vote. One can only hope that if it does pass, the government has been extensively stockpiling resources ready to go, which is something we're hoping to discuss in more detail next week. The mood music in D.C. appears to be favourable, that the package will indeed pass in some form. But we shouldn't downplay just how opposed to it some hardliners with the Republican Party are. Marjorie Taylor Greene, one of the most vocal opponents, saying that anyone who votes for Ukraine funding should be conscripted into the country's military. She's one of a handful of congressmen and women who've signalled they're willing to oust Johnson from the Speaker's chair if the vote goes ahead. Just months, of course, after Republicans deposed their last Speaker, Kevin McCarthy, in a similar rebellion. Another Conservative congressman, Matt Gates of Florida, described Johnson's decision to move ahead with the foreign aid bills as tantamount to surrender to the Democrats' demands. But Johnson says he will take the risk of being ousted given the urgency of the situation. Interestingly, Donald Trump appears to have offered Johnson some political cover by praising him for doing a very good job during an event with him last week. That could prove the vital factor in what many believe will be a very close vote on Saturday. Now, to give listeners just a sense of how urgent Kyiv perceives this bill, Ukraine's prime minister has told the BBC there will be a third world war if Ukraine loses its conflict with Russia as part of urging the US Congress to pass the package. Dennis Schmeichel expressed careful optimism the US lawmakers would pass the contested package, adding, we need this money yesterday, not tomorrow, not today. If we will not protect, Ukraine will fall. So the system of security will be destroyed and all the world will need to find a new system of security. Or there will be many conflicts, many such kinds of wars. And at the end of the day, it could lead to the Third World War. Now, Kremlin officials, as listeners will know, have ridiculed such claims as Western scaremongering, with Putin saying that the arguments he has ambitions for other parts of Eastern Europe are total nonsense. But that's not how Central and Eastern European countries see it. As the BBC's Rob Cameron has written in a piece on Slovakia, following the refusal of the Slovak cabinet to join the Czech initiative to buy up hundreds of thousands of shells for Ukraine, a crowdfunding campaign has exceeded its target of 1 million euros less than 48 hours after it launched. More than 23,000 people have donated more than 1.5 million euros since it launched on Tuesday afternoon, which will go directly to the Czech government's initiative. The piece quotes a 99-year-old Holocaust survivor and veteran of the 1944 Slovak national uprising against the Nazis who sparked this campaign. To quote him, we have to drive Putin out of Ukraine. We have to defeat him. I lived through the Second World War. I fought in it. I can tell you there was no point negotiating with Hitler and there's no point negotiating with Putin. So an interesting development in that context, although it does of course, bear repeating that the cost of these shells and ammunition is extensive and that amount of money is not going to go a long, long way. But nevertheless, it is symbolic of the feeling of anger in Slovakia about the shift following its election in attitudes towards Ukraine by the governing officials. So watch this space, I'll say. Now, since I referenced the BBC a moment ago, I also want to flag an interesting article from earlier in the week where they proved that Russia's military death toll in Ukraine has now passed at least the 50,000 mark. I say at least because there are many estimates that put it considerably higher than that. So 
but because it's of course exceedingly difficult to prove the numbers, this is them making a very conservative estimate. So they say in the second 12 months on the front line, as Moscow pushed its so-called meat grinder strategy, it found the body count was nearly 25% higher than in the first year. They've discovered this using open source information from official reports, satellite imagery, newspapers and social media. Another interesting aspect of it is just how short the life expectancy was for prison fighters in the Wagner group during that Battle of Bakhmut era. They were given a fortnight of military training before heading to the battlefield. And some recruits, the BBC say, were killed on the front line in the first two weeks of their contracts. So an interesting piece in relation to all of this. And we'll add a link in the description to both of the pieces I've just cited there. Turning to Europe. Next, a minor row has broken out between Paris and Moscow after the former seized a £7.6 million palatial French villa linked to Putin's ex-wife. Nicknamed Susanna, the villa, not the wife, the palatial Art Deco home was purchased for €5.4 million in 2013, with renovations totalling up to €3.5 million, according to French media. The villa, which is about 300 metres from the beach, is reported to be owned by a real estate company controlled by a Russian businessman married to the former Mrs Putin. The Kremlin is very, very upset about this. So Dmitry Peskov, the spokesman, has said that any encroachment on private property is illegal from the outset. The French authorities are undermining the foundations of their legal system. We've said it many times. Now, we all know why. The Kremlin gets so upset about this kind of activity, seizure of Russian assets abroad. Of course, what's increasingly relevant here is the timing because of those debates in the G7 about the seized Russian assets interests and whether they are going to be going to Ukraine or not. Those discussions are reaching a crunch point now and we're expecting some kind of agreement on that soon. More on it, of course, as we have it. Now, lastly, two stories out of Poland with the Polish Prime Minister Donald Tusk calling on Polish farmers to stop blockading the border with Ukraine. Tusk said that Ukraine is in an extremely difficult situation after recent Russian attacks on its energy infrastructure. Quote, we cannot in any way harm Ukraine in a situation where the fate of the war is being decided. I am counting on reflection and rejection of this form of of protest. Now it appears he's adopting the strategy of offering with one hand and and clenching a fist in the other because he is offering an apparent concession to the farmers saying the Polish government is ready to provide further forms of assistance to those who have lost part of their income thanks to Ukraine opening its grain exports in a way that is seen as harming Polish farmers and yet he has said that he has given state services permission to clear the checkpoints but he hopes there'll be no need for direct enforcement measures. Now, the other story that is coming out of Poland is a man suspected of aiding a plot by Russian intelligence services to assassinate Zelensky has been arrested in the country. The Polish national, named only as Paweł K, is suspected of supplying information to Russian military intelligence to help special forces plan an attempt on the Ukrainian president's life, Polish prosecutors are saying. They said the suspect had stated he was ready to act on behalf of the intelligence services of Russia and established contact with Russian citizens directly involved in the war. Ukraine's chief prosecutor, Andrei Kostin, said the suspect had been tasked with gathering and transmitting to the aggressor state information about security at an airport in southeastern Poland. Now, we know Zelensky passes through an airport frequently on trips abroad in that area. And it has also been used by foreign officials and aid convoys heading to Ukraine. It's a stark reminder, if one were needed, that Zelensky remains a democratically elected Western European leader who Russia seeks to eliminate violently. If that doesn't sharpen minds, I really don't know what will. Well, thank you very much, Dom Nichols and Francis, for your time and your reporting today. Just a note to our listeners, we'll have a rather lengthy interview later today with uh, Dr. Sergei Radchenko, a historian who, of course, was one of the co-authors behind the foreign affairs piece earlier this week that looked at the uh, intense negotiations that took place between Ukraine and Russia in the opening months of the full-scale invasion. So that conversation between us will be in today's podcast. So do listen to the podcast later when that comes out.
Uh, Dom and Francis, can I hear your final thoughts, please? Dom Nichols, would you like to go first? Yeah, sure, David. So with a team of researchers at the American Enterprise Institute, Mark Thiessen of The Washington Post has catalogued the weapon systems being produced in the US for Ukraine and identified the congressional districts where they're being made and how House members voted on the funding. The article was published yesterday. It's well worth uh, a look. They found that military aid was providing cash, a large, you know, huge amount of cash, to 122 defence production lines in 65 congressional districts across the country. And you can add to that all the restaurants and other businesses benefiting from being located near those arms factories. The authors point out that many members of Congress whose districts have been prime beneficiaries have been vocal opponents of Ukraine aid. They gave a regional breakdown of where the Ukraine aid is going, along with members who represent those districts. So just a quick whistle stop, and this is by no means the, the exhaustive list, the Ukraine aid is funding, for example, High Mars Hellfire and Javelin Engineering Kit in Matt Gates's Niceville, Florida district. It's funding High Mars launchers and vampire counter drone munitions in Bill Pose's Melbourne, Florida district. Funding High Mars guidance sets and radar systems in Anna Paulina Luna's Clearwater, Florida district. Barry Moore's Troy, Alabama district gets a chunk, as do the districts represented by. Alex Mooney in Rocket Center, West Virginia, and Diana Hushberger in Kingsport, Tennessee. Firms in Jim Jordan's Congressional District of Lima, Ohio, are churning out Abrams tanks and striker combat vehicles for Ukraine, thanks to the military aid he has opposed. There are many, many others. Go and and have a look at the Post's article, see if your representative is there, and do with that information whatever you wish. And just one other, if I may, David, just to let folks know... I'm not going to be here Monday, Tuesday. I'm going to be in the office, but not on the pod. I'm going to be qualifying. I'm going to do my two-day course to qualify as a mental health first aider. A reminder, I think, that we all need to make room for the light as well as the shade. And in that vein, I just I think it's you know I would like to share that I had a fantastic Indian takeaway this week. Francis can now whistle tunes through the gap tooth. And folks, you need to be aware that David in a very untelegraphed manner today, is enjoying going all left bank on us, sporting a roll neck and stubble, and looking like he's just stubbed out a gouloir and put down his coffee and book of French poetry to wipe away a tear. It is a thing of beauty. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Dom, for all of that. Francis Sternley. I also find it rather fetching, David. I did a shout out last week to our listeners on YouTube, given the bombardment of Russian bots they've been forced to endure the past few weeks. A listener called Michael wrote in on this theme more broadly, and I wanted to read an extract from his email. So thank you very much, Michael. And as always, to everyone who does write in, we do genuinely read every message, as we say. I'm a long-time listener of your podcast because it's one of the few consistent sources of reliable information. In the fog of war, that alone is an achievement. Thank you, Michael. It has also come to pass that others like you, YouTubers mostly, have done just as much to try and keep the world reminded that Ukraine is still at war and still needs our help. Russia has recently launched a new bot assault on these news resources, accusing them of everything from encouraging terrorism to paedophilia. And as a result, YouTube is bending the knee. I have found many of these channels even before I found your podcast, and they serve to point me your way. More than that, they also serve to keep millions of people in touch with the day-to-day updates in Ukraine. One of these channels has been doing daily updates since day one of the war, free of charge and with consistent quality and reliability. And as a result of that has grown a large audience, many of whom now support Ukraine directly with donations. He has, however, become another victim of the bot swarm and will be forced to close shop. His and other channels like his are a large part of what keeps the West in touch with Ukraine. And I fear it is for this exact reason they are being targeted. I know it's not exactly par for the course, but if you could spend even a minute bringing attention to this problem, I would be very much obliged. Well, I was very happy to do so, Michael. This is, of course, an issue we've talked about several times on the podcast, not just the bot swarms on our own work, but also the great work that's done by others in raising attention to what is happening in Ukraine and the challenges they face of their content being flagged 
or worse. So if anyone out there listens to the podcast who works for YouTube, please try twisting some knobs and pulling some levers because it's clear that the work many people is doing is being impeded by these swarms who are deliberately targeting them. To stress, this is not about censoring critical voices, but to try and curtail spam, which simply throws stuff out like Moscow is winning or like when I saw this week, Francis looks like book Harry Potter and David looks like film Harry Potter. Is this intentional? Though on second thought, that, that last one might be real. Sorry. Thank you so much, Dom and Francis. Earlier this week, Foreign Affairs published a fascinating long read on the intense diplomacy between Ukraine and Russia in the first few months of the full-scale invasion. It looks at what issues they were talking about, what they weren't, and tries to understand why, ultimately, the talks came to nothing. As the authors Samuel Charap and Sergei Radchenko write, what happened on the battlefield is relatively well understood. What is less understood is a simultaneous intense diplomacy involving Moscow, Kyiv, and a host of other actors, which could have resulted in a settlement just weeks after the war began. As a first draft of history, it's a hugely important piece of research and journalism. I caught up with historian Sergei Radchenko to discuss what they found. Here's our conversation. Well, thank you so much for your time, Sergei. Could you just start by giving us your timeline of the intensive diplomacy between Ukraine and Russia in the early months of the full-scale invasion? Uh, So, David, uh, diplomacy began almost immediately as the war also began. But the purpose of this diplomacy changed, I think, over time when the Russians and the Ukrainians began negotiating in Belarus. uh, The idea on the part of the Russian delegation was simply to force Ukraine to capitulate. The terms that they brought to the table uh, were capitulation terms. Um, But then as the time uh, went on, as the talks also moved to Istanbul, I think there was something of a more genuine, uh, I don't know, it's difficult to say really, but it seems that there was genuine dialogue between the Ukrainians and the Russians, uh, and uh, the terms also changed. Uh, Certainly the demands on the part of the Russians also changed. I think that is probably, or that was a reaction to the battlefield losses that the Russians were sustaining. The idea of taking Kiev in a couple of weeks obviously fell, you know, fell through and uh, Putin had to come up with something else. At least that's how I see this moment. Uh, the talks continued until approximately May when they were eventually broken off. But the last uh, document that we have in relation to these talks was the draft treaty on guarantees that is dated April 15th, 2022. You talked there about what was discussed. Let's talk about that. What were both sides putting on the table? And it'd be good to get an outline of that and then how that changed. Right. So the breakthrough, I think, happened in Istanbul before the actual Treaty on Guarantees was uh, negotiated and the document was produced, uh, the April 15th document. There was a communique that was issued uh, at the end of the talks in Istanbul, which the Ukrainians prepared the communique. The Russians seem to have agreed that to it. Uh, certainly, there were indications from the Russian statements that they were agreeing to the uh, general direction of the discussion. And basically, this communique had a number of points. can't remember now, maybe 11 points, I think, had, um, including um, uh, security guarantees, which is what Ukraine really wanted. And so when then the negotiations entered a practical phase of actually working out a treaty, um, the Ukrainians put forward this idea that they would have uh, you know, ironclad guarantees from the states that would be party to this agreement, which included for the Ukrainians the United States, crucially, um, but also the UK, France, a number of other states, including Turkey, uh, China would be, so P5, uh, and the Russians also added Belarus to the number of states that they wanted to see as security guarantors for Ukraine security. So the idea was like this. Uh, this was actually Article 5, very symbolic of the treaty on, on, on security guarantees. The idea was that if Ukraine is invaded again by any parties, presumably Russia, then the states that agreed to guarantee Ukraine security would then be able to provide it with air support, you know, close air space, direct military support, ammunition, and so on and so forth. This is what the Ukrainians wanted. Now, the Russians tried to undermine the meaning of this article, and they included 
in the document of April 15th, they included this provision to which the Ukrainians never agreed, that it was only possible to provide this aid if all of the parties to the treaty agreed to this, including Russia. So obviously that would undermine the whole purpose of guarantees. But there's even a more fundamental problem, and that is the Ukrainians were counting on Western buying. They want, they wanted the West to be part of the system of security guarantees for Ukraine without actually having consult it with the West about it. So you can see the American position coming to this. The Ukrainian answer saying, well, buy into this treaty that we're, being, that we're negotiating here with the Russians at gunpoint that would could, could potentially commit the United States to defense of Ukraine. You know, how could the Americans do that, right? So uh, that uh, raises some serious questions about whether this was a viable solution because it did not have Western buy-in. What I mean, you've talked a little bit there about what was discussed. What wasn't discussed? I'm just um, one of the lines in your article. The talks deliberately skirted the question of borders and territory. That seems like a fairly big omission. So yeah, uh, this was one of the issues that was uh, sort of in discussion, but they couldn't quite agree on what to make of it. So the treaty on security guarantees excluded Crimea. This was actually deliberate. This was mentioned in the treaty in the draft treaty. Uh, the idea was that suppose you know the treaty is concluded, it would not be applied to Crimea. You can see why. So suppose Ukraine decided to retake Crimea later on, they could not expect then other countries to help it do this. This is the idea behind excluding Crimea. But then there was also another interesting provision in the document, and that is that the security guarantees would not apply to the territory indicated on a map that was supposed to be attached to this treaty. However, the map is not attached, i.e. Uh, it was not yet agreed. I think the purpose or the idea of the negotiators was that they prepared the outline, the framework uh, for security guarantees, and then they would take this to the summit between Putin and Zelensky, and then they would look at the map and say, okay, here Russia is controlling this territory, this is where we stop it, and security guarantees will not apply to this, i.e. Russia will de facto continue to control this territory, but the security guarantees will apply to other parts of Ukraine. But you can see how this was difficult from the standpoint of Zelensky. Imagine taking this treaty back to the Ukrainian people and proving it in a referendum, saying, well, here we go, we're actually giving away, we're not, you know, not officially giving away, but basically we're acknowledging that Russia can control you know, 20% and terrorist Is that going to fly? Was that going to fly with the Ukrainian population? I don't know. So this was a difficult point that the treaty kind of skirts. Can you talk a little bit about who's involved? Who are both sides sending to, to, to these talks? And what does that show us maybe about how they're approaching it? The composition of the delegations changed over time. The talks began uh, with a delegation, the Russian delegation led by uh, Vladimir Medinsky, who was at one point Russia's very notorious culture minister, but also an aide to Putin, he was not really seen in the West uh, at that time, and perhaps even now, was not seen as a very serious negotiator. And this was actually one of the reasons that a lot of observers in the West at the time were saying, well, look, you know, how could this be, could, could this be a real serious negotiation when the Russian delegation is led by Medinsky instead of, let's say, somebody like Kozak, who is much, you know, was much more senior figure responsible for negotiations with Ukraine before, somebody, you know, much more with greater gravitas than Medinsky, who's, who's sometimes not taken seriously. But there were other people there as well, uh, people like the uh, now the head of LDPR, the Liberal Democratic Party of Russia, which is a quasi-fascist party, Slutsky. There was Boris Grislov, who's the ambassador to Belarus. There was Alexander Fomin, who was the head of the deputy minister for defense. So this is the Russian delegation. Now, the Ukrainian delegation included actually some fairly se senior figures, including, of course, Resnikov, who was at that time uh, Minister of Defense for Ukraine, now been replaced by Umerov, who was also part of the delegation. There was the there was Podolyak, Mikhail Podolyak was a member of the delegation, who was uh, close to Zelensky, and a few other people. One of them, one of the people who was a member of the Ukrainian delegation, was killed after the first round of the of the talks. Uh, he was killed because he was seen as a potentially Russian spy, although it never became clear from who was actually spying for. So anyway, so this was the composition. I guess the sort of the big question here is how serious are, were the Russians about this? It seems like it seems to some extent that you're not massively certain that it's actually really difficult to say that all of this is happening, of course, with the context of the, op the sort of opening months of the full scale invasion, the big attack on Kiev, which was then repulsed. So w what's your take on how? Yeah, that's the question, right? Like how serious were the Russians about these talks? Yeah, let me explain very briefly as, as to why I wanted to write this article. 
co-author it with Sam Cherub. Uh, we know that uh, talks took place. There are all kinds of um, uh, there are all kinds of statements about there have been statements by members of the negotiating teams, but. There's lack of understanding, really, about what happened. And a lot of people make sort of sweeping claims about the stocks. Oh, these stocks were doomed to fail. Or, you know, Boris Johnson is responsible for the failure of the stocks. That's Putin's, Putin's preferred line. Or, you know, Russia will never want to negotiate, etc. But these claims by sometimes serious authorities on Russian-Ukrainian relations are made without any evidence. So people say, okay, this is what we need to think about this. Uh, about these talks without offering any evidence. Trust me because I know this stuff, right? That's the kind of stuff that we hear from leading figures sometimes involved in an analysis of the Russian-Ukrainian conflict. So what I wanted to do and what we did with Sam Cherub was simply to uh, tell in a very German von Ranke, you know, German historian uh, von Ranke, you know, von Ranke and Styles, just tell it how it was, just tell the story more or less. And that's part of what we did, which is basically re we had the chronology, we had the evidence from different interviews uh, that we conducted with policymakers involved in those talks. And uh, most importantly, we had documents that emerged from these talks. And that's, more, you know, that's something that, that was not in the public domain. We had access to these documents. And we basically told the story of the talks in March, April, and we ask the question of why the talks failed or were the Russians negotiating in good faith. And there's no real proper answer to this because there's still blank spots in our understanding of what was happening. I think that some of those will be probably resolved with time. So maybe 30 years later, historians will be coming back to the story and say, well, here's what we now know. Here are, you know, here's what we can now say. Some will never be resolved because simply policymakers did not have the record or the record may be contradictory. But we ask those questions. We ask why did the talks fail and were the Russians negotiating in, in, in good faith? And on the second question, there's no clear answer. And we say that on the article. We just don't know what to say. It seemed that the Russians were clearly, from the start, were simply trying to force Ukraine to capitulate. But then it seems that later, Putin understanding that he that the war was not going in the right direction was kind of hedging his bets, really, and trying to figure out whether maybe there was some other exit from this war. And, you know, as historian, I would know that, and, you know, those who, who do history generally know that events are... Uh, you know, nothing is really certain until it happens. There are contingencies, there are things that could develop in any direction. So it, it's possible, it's possible, I don't know how plausible, but it's possible to say that the, these talks could have led to actual peace deal being made. But there are serious reasons why this did not happen. And we explain this in the article. And, I, and th those are fundamentally, I think, I mean, the main reason, I think, is that Zelensky understood that uh, the Russian, the Russians being in retreat around Kiev, he thought that with Western support, he could probably win this war. Because fundamentally, I mean, look at, at the terms of this treaty. They're not great for Ukraine. They were never going to be great for Ukraine. I don't want to go as far as to say that Ukraine would be turned into a vassal state, but they were pretty humiliating. So Zelensky, instead of going that down that, decided to basically fight the conflict on the ground because the Russians were in retreat and perhaps the war could be won on the battlefield. Now, the lack of Western buy-in, I think, is a hugely important factor as well. Because for Zelensky, security guarantees without the West did not mean anything. What, are we going to trust the Russians to provide security guarantees? I mean, the Russians are invading your country, right? How can you trust them to provide any security guarantees? So that is another factor. And then the Bucha and Rapina are crucial because, of course, in, as the Russians retreated from around Kiev, they abandoned the cities that they took, um, uh, including Bucha and Rapina. And when the Ukrainians entered those places, they discovered absolutely you know, horrible atrocities carried out by the Russian troops. And Zelensky was outraged, properly outraged. But another thing that I think also, you know, Bucha and Rapina allowed Zelensky to do was to say, look, the Ukrainian public opinion and the world public opinion is behind me. And we're going to bring this war to successful end because you cannot negotiate with this terrorists. You cannot negotiate with the people who are doing this to our people. Uh, so those are the reasons as I see them. What surprised you about looking into this period of history of the start of the full-scale invasion? Well, there are lots of interesting things in these documents that I found curious. The idea that the, 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 that the Ukrainians were trying to introduce this Article 5 with Russia's buy-in, but also with the Western buy-in was a little bit you know, unusual. So that was interesting for me. Then the, what the Russians were trying to do is also extremely fascinating, and that is that they 
tried to include in the uh, treaty on security guarantees provisions about changing particular Ukrainian laws. And there were provisions about changing laws on decommunization and on sort of historical memory, how in Ukraine they there has been an effort to I don't know, I don't know what he's glorified. Perhaps calls the is the name, but you know, those independence fighters who fought against the Soviets, but the Russians see those as uh, pro-Nazi actors. And so there's this dispute about this historical memory. And the Russians wanted to change those particular laws in uh, the you know, Ukrainian laws that dealt with those issues, but also with the Russian language. They wanted Russian recognized. We don't talk this about this in the article, but I can tell you that it was in the draft treaty. The Russians wanted Russian recognized as an official language in Ukraine. So that's another interesting thing. So from Ukraine's perspective, you can see that they, I mean, the Ukrainians refused to negotiate this. They said, well, that was not in the Istanbul communique. Why should we include that in a treaty on security guarantees? Or, or moreover, it's humiliating for Ukraine to have that, right? Humiliating because it represents interference in Ukraine's domestic affairs. But you could also uh, argue, and we raised this issue in the article, we, we say that maybe this was a face-saving device uh, on Putin's part. Uh, because initially when he started the war, remember he made the speech about Ukraine where he talked about denazification. Everybody understood denazification as basically getting rid of uh, Zelensky and basically replacing the government in Kiev. And now the Russians are saying, okay, we'll change this article in this law or that article in that law, and that will be denazification. So there was an additional protocol to the treaty, which listed six laws that were supposed to be changed. And there are some also other laws and languages that they wanted to be changed. So it's, it's interesting. And there are different interpretations about this that we can make. And I, I haven't really come to any particular conclusion. Finally, there was an interesting thing in the document, the provisional document of April 15th, um, 2022, that suggested that they plan to finalize everything by the end of April. Uh, so it's a, the, the idea was to have a summit very soon, and they were planning to move very fast. Wow. How close are Zelensky and Putin to, to their teams on this? That's the million-dollar question, really. It's very difficult to answer this, because you might argue in Zelensky's case that Zelensky was desperate. That's why he was negotiating. He was throwing things at the wall, and uh, he was seeing you know, what was going to stick and what was going to work. And so he had various options. Uh, the peace track was one, the peace negotiations track was one option, but then he also was seeing that he would be receiving, uh, especially you know, after Kiev was, uh, the Russians retre retreated from Kiev, it became clear that he was not in, in any immediate danger, but also that the West would be providing aid, so he'd be able to receive aid from the West. And so that was another kind of potential solution to the problem, which ultimately for him outweighed the idea of, of negotiating a treaty at a gunpoint with the Russians. Right, that's not you know that was not seen as a very good idea. Now for Putin, uh, Putin later announced uh, that uh, you know the treaty was nearly ready, and then the Ukrainians discarded this. The reality, of course, is much more complicated because there were serious disagreements, as we, as we have just talked about. Uh, the Ukrainians were pushing back against some of the Russian demands. As, as some other disagreements included, for example, the, this provision about de demilitarization because they were trying to negotiate how many um, armaments would Ukraine would be allowed to have in you know in various branch branches of the armed forces and there were huge differences between the Ukrainian and the Russian positions none of that was negotiated by or none of that was resolved by the time that the negotiations broke off I suppose if the Ukrainians accepted Russian demands, that perhaps Putin would have endorsed this document. But that is a very interesting question as a, whether it was in Ukraine's interest to do so. Um, I mean, you know, if Ukraine ultimately wins the war against Russia and everything turns out fine and wonderful, then this negotiation can be regarded as a bad dream. If, on the other hand, this war continues for an indeterminate period and uh, with ever graver, worse co costs for Ukraine and things become even worse there in terms of loss of life and destruction, then you might look back on this and think, well, could, it, you know, could we salvage something from those negotiations and bring this war to some kind of a conclusion? I don't know. You know, this is not a call that I, as a historian, would make. My role was simply to look at this process together with Sam Cherub and actually say what happened. You mentioned earlier the blank spots 
that we still don't know and maybe never will know. Could you just go into maybe a bit more detail? What are the blank spots that, that you think you've sort of identified from the work you've done? Well, the blank spots uh, that we are going to find out much more about is the reaction by Ukraine's Western partners. So in the future, we'll be able to go to the documents. We'll see how this question was discussed at the U.S. National Security Council, for example, or in correspondence between the American diplomats and the Ukrainian diplomats, uh, or how other uh, players uh, factored into this. For example, you know how Boris Johnson approached that. And of course, Boris Johnson appears in the article. He's an interesting player there. I, we reject the simplistic notion that he, quote unquote, forced Ukraine to give up negotiations. We think it's nonsense, but it's interesting, nevertheless, to see how the British were um, in, in discussing this question. And that will become available in you know a couple of decades, I guess. We'll find out what really happened, maybe even earlier. Who knows? Um, uh, but some questions will be very difficult to pin down. So this question about what Putin ultimately thought, you know, he may be given even instructions to his negotiator saying, you know, negotiate this. Maybe is it'll be a good result, I'll, I'll endorse it. But do we really know what he's thinking in the depth of his mind? You know, is he thinking, okay, I'll just play this, I'll play here, I'll see how this comes out, but actually I'm banking on these force that's what's going to work out. We may not know, and then perhaps even Putin himself did not know at the time because he was just, you know, a, a juggling many things. So, uh, uh, but this is not a this is not a new thing for historians. I mean, I'm a historian of the Cold War, and I can tell you that uh, now uh, we are still trying to decide what Stalin thought about the Cold War and you know what he wanted to do in the 1940s. And there's great debate about it because nobody knows. And I've looked at all these documents that have become available, and there's a, a huge amount of the material, but still there are grave questions that cannot be answered. And I think we'll have some of those questions as well in this case. What do these documents, what does this story show us about where we are? Do the things talked about potentially provide a framework in the future if the Russians and Ukrainians do sit down and talk again? Or, or is this very much something from history that they'll, they'll never get back to this point and, these, and these, this level of discussion? Well, sure. I mean, circumstances have also changed over the last two years. So um, some of the things that happened in the intervening period uh, make it difficult to go back to uh, those propositions that were being discussed and debated in March, April 2022. I mean, consider the whole issue of their, in the atrocities you know, in Mariupol, for example, things that happened there. The thousands and tens of thousands of people have been killed, right? That is, you know, that is a heavy price that has already been paid for this war. And so now to go back and to negotiate on the same basis as back in 2022, well, it seems very difficult. However, eventually it seems uh, there's going to be some kind of a negotiation about a ceasefire at least. I don't know that a comprehensive settlement can be achieved. I think the difficulty in achieving a comprehensive settlement will remain the same as it is uh, as it was in 2022, i.e., how do you do it without American buying? And will the Americans actually be willing to be party to any kind of settlement like this, potentially drag them into an outright war with Russia? And I think there's a, a justified uh, caution in the White House uh, with regard to this proposition. Without the Western buy-in, uh, it's very difficult to see how a comprehensive settlement could be achieved. A ceasefire could be achieved, sort of like they did in, Cor in the Korean War in 1953. A ceasefire was achieved and it proved lasting. Look, uh, we're how many decades after the Korean War? But it still has not, well, for now at least, it has not, you know, violence has not returned in any kind of significant way uh, to the Korean Peninsula. Uh, although it was very provisional at that time, and 53 was certainly very provisional. So, so that's probably what may happen in the future. In, a, in other words, a, a ceasefire may well be negotiated, but a lot, of course, hinges on factors that we cannot know much about. So, for example, the Russians now are very confident about their ability to impose their preferred military scenario on Ukraine. Why is that? Because they sense that there's a fatigue in the West with regard to this war. They see that the American Congress is not passing the aid that is necessary to defend Ukraine from Russian aggression. They see that there's that Trump administration could, for example, replace the current Democratic uh, administration in uh, in Washington, and who knows what ideas those guys might have with regard to the Ukraine conflict. So Putin feels like time is on his side. He's got a lot of resources, and it doesn't seem that he's even in the mind 
uh, to return to the drawing board and look again at the document. Although it has to be said, he keeps talking about it. He keeps talking about this document. He keeps voicing his readiness to return to it and use it as a basis for something. But, you know, can we really trust him? Um, and would the Ukrainians accept it? There are lots of unanswered questions here. So, okay, is there anything we haven't spoken about in regards to your story that you, you, you want to mention? Look, I think it's uh, it's an interesting article that Sam Cherup and I uh, cooperated in, in, in putting together. And I think it represents the first draft of this uh, history that is a fascinating history uh, that uh, could have or perhaps could not have averted uh, or could have stopped the war in Ukraine or could not have stopped the war in Ukraine. It's very difficult to say, but I think we made an honest uh, effort uh, to understand these questions and we welcome further debate and we welcome other historians in the future coming back to this question and telling us how we were wrong on the basis of new evidence, of course, not just you know, claims that are not based on anything. Sergei Rachenko, thank you so much for your time. Ukraine The Latest is an original podcast from The Telegraph. To stay on top of all of our Ukraine news, analysis and dispatches from the ground, subscribe to The Telegraph. You can get your first three months for just £1 at www.telegraph.co.uk forward slash Ukraine The Latest. Or sign up to Dispatches, our Ukraine newsletter, which brings stories from our award-winning foreign correspondents straight to your inbox. We also have a Ukraine live blog on our website, where you can follow updates as they come in throughout the day, including insights from regular contributors to this podcast. You can listen to this conversation live at 1pm London time each weekday on Twitter Spaces. Follow The Telegraph on Twitter so you don't miss it. To our listeners on YouTube, please note that due to issues beyond our control, there is sometimes a delay between broadcast and upload. So if you want to hear Ukraine the latest as soon as it is released, do refer to the podcast apps. If you appreciated this podcast, please consider following Ukraine The Latest on your preferred podcast app. And, if you have a moment, leave a review, as it helps others find the show. You can also get in touch directly to ask questions or give comments by emailing ukrainepod at telegraph.co.uk. We do read every message. And you can contact us directly on Twitter. You can find our Twitter handles in the description for this episode. As ever, we are especially interested to hear where you are listening from around the world. Ukraine The Latest was produced by Rachel Porter. And the executive producers are David Knowles and Louisa Wells.